Cool. Welcome, everyone. Thanks for joining us tonight. Uh, so, you know, data engineering, this is our second version of, um, you know, doing this virtually. Uh, we've moved to Google Meet for the time being. So we had to set up a domain and stuff. Uh, we lost the rope, like, currently holding off on doing Roman Zoom for uh, you know, the one that Epon had. Um, but tonight, um, we've got Bill, um, Bill Bejek. Is that correct? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Bill Bedrick from Confluent. He is a, let's see, you're an architect on Confluent's DataX team. DevX team. Um, we'll be talking about challenges, data integration and design and architecture patterns. Um, and just kind of general Apache key Kafka stuff and um, showing how engineering teams can build some scalable solutions. Is that about it, right? Yeah, that's, so that, that about sums it up, yeah. Cool. Well, please take it away. Okay, uh, let me go ahead and um, okay. Can everybody see that? Okay. Um, uh, we, we can see you. Can you? Oh, I'm sorry. Hold on for one second. I forgot to hit the present button. Okay. Now, can you see the the big slide stream? All things. Mm -mm. Not yet. Hey, Bill. It's Jim Lee. You gotta you gotta hit present now in the uh, lower right hand corner of your uh, Google Chrome Google Hangout. I did. Tab. Oh, never mind. I didn't share the screen. There we go. Now it's coming. Okay. Yeah, so, I can see it now. Now okay. just share the other screen, Bill. What's that? Share share your your other screen. We're seeing the uh, presenter notes screen. No worries. We're not in a big rush to go anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> Right, Dave? There we go. <laughs> Captive audience. Okay. Now, how about that? Bingo. Yeah. All right. Third time's a charm. Okay. So, uh, <clears throat> welcome, everybody, uh, to Stream All Things Patterns of Modern Data Integration. Uh, we'll just introduce myself briefly. Uh, I'm an integration architect on the uh, developer experience team at Confluent. Uh, prior to DevX, I spent about three years as an engineer on the Kafka Streams team. I am a Apache Kafka committer and the author of Kafka Streams in Action. Uh, and as a side note, I've lost my mind and just agreed to, to do a second edition of this book. So we'll see how that goes. Um, so with that, let's go ahead and start um, our presentation. Um, but we're going to start talking about the evolution of data integration. Um, in my own career, going back several years, uh, you just had this concept of a central data warehouse. And on a particular project I was on, that just ended up being a big Oracle database. And one of the challenges we had is we would get data, uh, everything was batch mode back then, we'd get this big drop of data, and it would li literally take uh, a couple of days to ingest it. Yeah, so it's just, and if anything broke during the process, you had to start over again. Uh, so that was that was kind of painful. And then on top of that, the searches against that, there was uh, certain searches that were people would perform. The average search time was like three minutes. So the performance wasn't great, but that was what we had. So we lived with it. Uh, then at some point Hadoop came available and we actually had our own on-premise Hadoop cluster. And that made things a lot better, that made life a lot better for us because uh, the inge ingest time went down significantly. I think it was like 10, 10 hours or so. And that was even 
it would have been shorter if it was a straight ingest, but we needed, there was several data sets that came and we would pre-join them and store that in the leucine index. So uh, having, you know, the, having a Hadoop cluster allowed, made that processing possible. And, and as a result, pointing our application to hit a leucine index, average search time went down to three seconds. Uh, but the, it was still not perfect because we, okay, we used Hadoop, we're putting all this data into Hadoop. It wasn't easy to share. It wasn't, you know, for someone else to look at or someone else to get access to it. Uh, you know, you had to write custom code and just it, it wasn't easy to share. And then there was also another uh, aspect of we had this giant Hadoop cluster and we were the only ones using it. So we're kind of like paying for, you know, you had the ingest time and then we're processing the data. But then after that, it wasn't, it wasn't ideal and it was hard to, hard to share that or, you know, to share, to sh even share the cluster itself. And now, you know, moving forward now, we have um, data stream. We have, you know, streaming data. And that gives you the ability to now uh, just work with the data as it comes. Um, it's great for microservice applications and because you can plug in and then just you can consume and process the data as it comes. And part of this migration of how things have come, how far things have come, is also um, the, the jobs we see within data integration. Uh, going back to that project that I mentioned that I worked on, we had our own team of dedicated engineer, ETL engineers. And not just our project, but multiple projects with, under the umbrella of the organization I was working for. Uh, they were responsible for this. And they used Pentaho, and it was really kind of, it was, really kind of it, was, it was siloed. You know, they would, you know, if you wanted data ingested, you had to go talk to them, you know, talk to the ETL team, and then they would set things up, get the data in, and move it out wherever you wanted it to, and then you'd point your, you know, in our case, it was an Oracle database. Um, when we moved to the Hadoop cluster to do the processing, we ended up writing code to do that pre-joining I was talking about. So that kind of, that ended up falling on our shoulders. And so no longer, uh, the, the, we didn't need the ETL team anymore. And then moving forward uh, to more recent experiences, uh, it's always, there, there aren't, as far as I, from what I've seen, the, that job has kind of gone away. You just have software engineers you just have people that are writing code, and the focus has gone from, you know, moving data around to building an application to access the data. So, the, you know, along those lines, the world has changed quite a bit. Um, you know, architecture-wise, you have lots of microservices. That, you know, the application I was just talking about was a big monolith, you know, and that was kind of the way things were. You had the big monolith, and then everything was hosted. So now you have microservices. You have things in the cloud. You can either host it or you can have things in the cloud. Uh, as far as information coming in, you have the Internet of Things. You have sensors, so you can get sensor data. And you know, we have machine learning, uh, which requires a lot amount of data and processing. And so the, you know, the, the whole landscape has changed quite a bit. But our goal hasn't changed that much. We want to build applications that are going to deliver value for customers and within the business. And you want to do it in such a way that you don't have to wait, that as things change, as events happen, that you can react to these, you know, react to this stuff. And so a lot of times it involves building a data pipeline. So what we're going to notice in today what I'm going to talk about are some patterns that are common. This isn't necessarily meant to be like a silver bullet or this is the way things have to be done. <clears throat> but just an overall, we kind of notice things happening and things that have worked uh, with customers and other people, other uh, users of Kafka. And then all, throughout, we're going to use uh, an example of a large hotel chain is going to be kind of our use case. 
Uh, there's a lot of, uh, you know, hotels, people check in. There's a lot, well, it's, it's an environment, it's an event rich environment if you think about it. People check in, they check out, uh, they book rooms via the web, they do searches. Uh, when they're in the hotel, they make purchases, things of that nature. Which leads me to the next main point is all your data are event streams. Everything is an event. You think about your own life, uh, you know, you take your car into the shop and you you know, pay to have new tires put on. You are at work, you get phone calls and you have to suddenly adapt. You know, you get a phone call and uh, the meeting that was scheduled at four is now scheduled at one. So that's an, an event you have to adapt to, you uh, react to right away. So everything is an event. Uh, purchases, you know, people buying things. Uh, you get an invoice. Uh, from a supplier or something like that. Trades, if you, you know, you call your broker up and you buy or sell stock. Um, excuse me for one second. Um, that's also an event. Um, and then customer experience. Every, you know, going back to the hotel event, Someone checks in, event, uh, they, they're in their, their room and they get something from the mini bar. They go down to the hotel restaurant, buy something, everything, it's just constant events. So as an example, we're gonna talk about the humble page view event. So this is just someone clicks on a page and we can see just what this will generate itself. So on our page view event, there's all kinds of information that's going to, you're going to have. You've got session ID, the user ID, um, the timestamp. You've got this information. And so you've got this one event that, that's, that has occurred. But from this one event, you could easily have several interested parties. And it's going to mean different things to different people. Uh, you know, um, did they come in as a result of a promotion? So the marketing team is going to want to know, you know, what does this page view event mean to that? You know, is our, you know, you know is the promotion reaching the desired people? Um, and then, you know, for search relevance, is it, you know, did they land what they looked for? Did they get them to the right page? Um, you have other people looking at this property, you know, 15 other people are looking at this too. And then for history, people that you're keeping track of these things, someone who looked at this ended up booking some other room or it just ended up booking what kind of room they book. So this leads us to the first pattern because thinking about the fact that we're going to, um, the first pattern is streaming everything into Kafka. And this is important <clears throat> because if you think of Kafka as a central nervous system for your data, so everything's going to come in and it's going to come into Kafka. And the benefit to that is, again, you can have multiple, you can have multiple uh, readers, if you will. So in, in the old, in previous to Kafka, you might have an architecture look something like this. So you've got multiple sources of inputs. You've got the, all of these other applications that need to connect to each other and know about each other. And so it's kind of, it's hard to manage and hard to keep track of. And needless to say, you probably have uh, a lot of data duplication and other issues of the connectivity that uh, along those lines. So with Kafka as your central nervous system, streaming everything into Kafka, you end up with something that looks like this. Everybody, is everything comes into Kafka, the answer central nervous system. And it gives you the ability to, uh, what I like to say is write, run, write once, read many times. And what I mean by that is Kafka doesn't keep track of who is consuming the data. Um, going back to the premise that an event means different things to different people, uh, consumers of events are also going to consume them in different patterns. 
So Kafka does not keep track of, of how these, of who's using the data and how. So it, it really kind of simplifies the logic. You don't have to worry about how long you keep the record around or anything like that. You, know, you set a, there's a retention limit in Kafka for how long a record's going to reside on the log. But aside from that, it doesn't keep track of consumers reading it and who's using what or how, how they're doing. Everyone's kind of free to just consume it at, at will. But it's one central location. So everything's coming in, and then you've got your consumers that don't need to know anything about each other to, to, to access this data. So again, it's speaking of events, you, you got this, you have this atomic broadcast. You send it once and everyone gets it once. Um, but again, it's, it's also important to consider that um, you write it once and then you can have multiple reads, you know, different consumers you know, seeing the same event and they can do what they, what they want. And again, it's once the record is goes into Kafka, it's stored. You have a retention time uh, for how long that record's going to be stored, but you don't have to worry about it. It's not like as soon as X number of consumers, other messaging systems, you know, you might have to keep it memory or if a certain number of, of readers read it, the message goes away. It's not, it's not like that. And additionally, Kafka gives us um, powerful uh, processing, stream processing primitives. Um, when you start thinking of streams as events, that really allows you to, to think of, you know, you want to respond to certain events. Some are more critical than others, so you want to respond quicker to certain events versus other ones. And then you can also integrate integrate um, streams and tables. You can, there's a relationship between an event stream and a table. Uh, a database table, <clears throat> you can query it and it gives you a view of the world at that point in time. And you can query, you might have fields, you might have a person table that's got a name, address, field, other uh, attributes of that person in the table. Well, you can have the same thing in the stream. You can have an event stream and let's just say you have a person, you have a stream of person object or person event, you can query that stream constantly. Again, the difference is that when you query a table, it's going to give you that view of that snapshot in time, and it's not going to change until the table changes. Well, you can still query a stream, but now your updates are constant. So you issue the first query, you're going to get a view of what happens at time X, and then you can query it again, and then you're going to get another view of things. So there's a duality there of streams and tables. So this leads us to our next um, pattern because we're talking about sharing events and events not meaning everything, the same thing to everybody. And that's, we want to keep compatibility between our systems. And to kind of make the point, I'll walk through an example of what I, what I mean by this. Okay, you've got a hotel, you've going back to our hotel chain, hotel chain um, they've built up uh, services that are going to read from, you've got this event stream coming in, you've got some microservices reading from this event stream, they're doing different things with the data. Um, but if you notice, over here, you've got a timestamp, it's a long timestamp, so it's a long, and not necessarily ideal for uh, human readability. It's, it's kind of, it's a terrible way to represent time or can be, depending on what you're doing. So someone in the booking service decides, okay, if we're gonna make a change, we want something that's readable. So we're gonna turn that into a string in this format here that you see. Um, right there, we're gonna, you know, we're gonna turn that into that string right there. That's great. Now they're going to start pumping that in and make that change. But now that breaks all of your downstream consumers because everyone's expecting that timestamp. Everyone was operating off of that timestamp. And there was no communication outwards. You know, it's in isolation, that's a great idea. Um, but not everything is always communicated out as it should be. And so you can have a result like this. And chances are, it's going to happen on a Friday 
late in the day. So this brings me to the fact that schemas are APIs or your event object is an API. So just as um, everybody is sharing this event, everyone's seeing this event coming in on your streaming architecture. And it was, in a sense, everyone's sharing that event object. So that becomes the API. That becomes the contract. And so when I say you need to keep compatibility, you don't want all these other systems to have to stay in sync with each other because that wouldn't, that really wouldn't be maintainable to have, you know, n number of systems knowing what all the other systems are doing or what they're, what, you know, what, uh, what kind of object they're expecting. So this event object that you have, that's the contract. Everyone's seeing that, so that's the agreed upon con contract. So that's your API. And one thing that you, you can do to maintain that is to use, there's all uh, several ways you can do that, but one thing is with schema registry. And it's a separate standalone service, so it's open source. And you register a schema and you have um, serializers that um, for a while was just Avro, but now it also supports protobuf and JSON. And you have serializers that um, know where to connect to schema registry and get the schema for deserializing and serializing your object. So now you have this upfront way, because when things fail, when things break, you want to know as soon as possible. You really don't want to have to deploy and then cross your fingers to see if everything works. You really want to know earlier in the pipeline, earlier the better. Maybe not necessarily when you're developing at your desk because you need to iterate quickly, but you want to have some sort of test environment where you can see where things are going, where people can be can make changes, but you'll get notification soon as to um, what those changes, what the changes are. Oops. Okay, so we have this integrated development cycle where, like I said, locally, you're just going to, you know, iterate quickly, but then you're going to push to a test or a staging environment, and then you're going to have a test registry, and that is the ideal place for, you know, you should get the feedback there, you know, we want to make changes to this object, and schema registry also gives you the ability for, um, some backwards or forwards compatibility. There's several ways to configure that. So that's, so again, the compatibility is, is important. And we're saying basically that the key takeaway is that your event object, your objects on your event stream, that's your contract, that's the API. All right, so now we're gonna move on to a third pattern, uh, which is Parallel message transfer, message transformation. And I need to explain a little bit what that is that I'm referring to. So you have, you've got your event stream, you're producing records into Kafka, you've got a producer who's writing records into Kafka. Now the unit of work in a Kafka is a log. And it's basically you append one event at the end of the log. And that's what we have. Um, right here. This is that's a log. So records come in, they just get written on the end, in the end of the log. And that's the the, the, the the log is the level of work within copy. And to parallel to to take advantage of to basically to be able to horizontally scale out. You want to parallelize these things. So you're going to have partitions and partitions. So you use keys to determine where the record goes on and which partition. But it's the same thing. A record just gets appended to the end of the log. So <clears throat> to process these records, you're going to have a consumer. A consumer is, you know, at simplest level, you're going to have a single partition and you're going to have a topic with a single partition. You've got one consumer. And we're reading from that partition, processing records. Very simple. <clears throat> but you can have um, more partitions, so and it can scale up to the point where you have a partition, a consumer per partition. 
Now you'll never have more than one consumer per partition, but you can scale that up. And then you can have different consumer groups. So again, this is, you know, you have different, you have a consumer group that's composed of any number of consumers. And they, the only thing they share is the consumer group I gave. And then through the Kafka um, rebalance protocol, a consumer group is going to, they're going to get assignments. So you're going to sh share these partitions across consumers within a group. And <clears throat> what that does is the rebalance protocol handles that if one of your consumers drops out, the partition or partitions it was responsible for are assigned to other viable members of the group. And what this does <clears throat> is by having separate consumer groups, again, they don't, they don't step on each other's toes. They don't even know the other one exists and they're reading records. Um, but this starts to fall down a little bit when, because you manage, you're managing this yourself. So you can easily get thousands of partitions. So that means within a consumer group, you could have thousands of consumers and then you're going to need to manage you, you know, the, the, the Kafka rebalance protocol handles um, the assignment of partitions to these consumers. But it can get a little little unwieldy to have like to deploy these yourself. So it's this simple consumption model is something that we've been termed the hipster stream processing model. And basically, uh, you know, you have something that produces, you can transform it, and then you can consume it and send it off someplace else. Uh, it's stateless, very flexible, and it's super. It's very simple. It's simple till it's not to hit road bumps, to hit a speed bump or big hill. And the picture we have here is in San Francisco. Um, I the name of this by it's a uh, these uh, I forget the name of the bike, but uh, but basically it doesn't have a free wheel. It doesn't have brakes. You have to just constantly pedal. Very very simple. It's great when you're on the flat, but a bike like this when you hit a hill it's going to be really challenging because you, it doesn't have any gears and there's no, so you're just constantly petting you hit a hill. So it's great until you hit that first big hill. So the analogy we have for this is Kafka Connect. Now going back to what I was saying about consumers and how many consumers you have and partitions and that, uh, Connect is going to abstract that away for you. So you've got Kafka Connect, and let me take a step back. Most of the time, um, you're going to have data in some sort of external system that you're going to need to get it out from, and you're going to have some sort of external system that needs that you need to write to, whether it be Elasticsearch, Mongo, uh, Cassandra, and then the same thing on the consuming side more than likely. And Kafka, if we're saying Kafka is the central nervous system, we have to get these events into it somehow. And this is where Connect comes in. It abstracts away, uh, if I were to go back a couple of slides, it, it, it abstracts it away. Whereas you don't have to, in this case, you, you're, you're wondering how many consumers do I stand up you know, do I want a consumer per partition? Is, you know, five partitions per consumer okay? You're standing this up, and then you've got the producer where you need to connect it to the data source and get that data in and write it into a record yourself, convert it to a record. Well, now, the same pattern is used by Connect, but it's going to handle all those details for you. So basically, you would point a, um, a JDBC, let's just say, for example, a JDBC Connect, you would point that in the database and you can enable it for, uh, to look at the primary key column. And every time there's a new record inserted, Connect is going to grab that record, push it into Kafka. And the same thing on the, uh, on the, on the other side, you know, you want m most of the time, not most of the time, all the time, that data you have in Kafka you're going to want to get that out to an external system. You're going to want to do something with it once it gets into Kafka, but you're going to want to do something with it, transform it somehow, or 
convert it into something else, maybe a bigger object, some sort of aggregation object. But at the end of the day, that's going to go back out to another general system. And that's where then you've got connect. Uh, on the left-hand side here, where these are considered source connectors because they're pulling from some other source and getting the data in the Kafka. And on the right, we have sync connectors that are going to get the records out of Kafka and write them to whatever external system that, that you need to. And the nice thing is this, it subtracts a lot of the details away for you. And so it'll balance, it'll, you know, you can spin these up and they'll handle load for you automatically. Uh, if you have a task that fails over, um, you, know, you, you can have multiple tasks, you can figure the max number of tasks. So it could scale up um, when you have more, more throughput or more data coming in and then scale down as needed. So that's, that's the importing and the exporting. But the other part of Connect that's important is it's an opportunity to uh, transform the records. Because um, most of the time, uh, something comes in, uh, you might need to, um, let's just say there's something that has uh, a record comes in, going back to our page view information, let's just say that there is some information on there that was considered personal you don't want to share. So you can either drop it or mask it somehow. Uh, the, you may, records may come in without a key. So you could have just something that's sending in records that doesn't have a key. And you know, I mentioned Kafka works with partitions and it works with keys and values. And that's how you get records onto the correct partitions with a key. So you could use connect to actually add that key based on information that's present in the data or combination of that or just, you know, just extract the field from the record and use that as your key. And then the true is the same is true for records that are going out of Kafka. You, you might want to modify the ones that are coming out. Um, you could, you know, the data system, you might have several data systems you need to write to. So you can have several, you can have, you know, separate connectors for those. And they might be expecting the data in a different format. So instead of having to store that data, you could transform it, uh, you know, as it's going, as it's going out um, to those external systems. Um, you can, you know, have different connectors for uh, higher priority things that would go to um, a faster data store. Um, one thing I would mention at this point is uh, connect simple message transforms are meant for simple changes, small changes. If you were going to do like some heavy transformation, you would want to use uh, something like Kafka Streams to where you would read that in your Kafka Streams application would do the transformation and write it back out to a topic. But then connect is your bridge for um, <clears throat> writing to an external system. And again, the beauty of it is that if you have it in, in a topic, anybody can consume from it. And it kind of decouples. You know, your Streams application doesn't need to know, you know what it's transforming for. It's decoupled completely from the outside world. So this is... This is the simplest, right? So far, and this has been the simplest approach. And by that, I mean the fact that we haven't encountered state yet. Everything coming in, we're not really concerned about state. You know, you just come in, it's a transformation, you do something with it, and then you write it back out. Um, but that's not always the case. A lot of times, uh, an event that's captured from something, it has a narrow view of the world. If we go back to our page view event, you just had the property was looking at, and you just had like the, the member ID, the loyalty ID of the person. Um, and it's just, it's, it's focused on the page view event, but for it to have meaning, you, you need to add you know, context to it, but also broader context. You know, what does this page view event, what does it signify? So a lot of that, that leads us to our fourth pattern, which is, um, streaming enrichment, how you've got these events coming in, but how do we make sense of it? And even if the event itself 
is kind of stands on its own. There's probably something, some other bits of information we could attach to it that allow you to, to act on this event in a more powerful way. So our example that we're gonna, we're gonna go back to our hotel and we're gonna say that the hotel is, it's running a promotion. And we want to send platinum members. We're looking at beach properties. We want to send an email to platinum members who are looking at beach properties, a discount package for a new hotel we have in Hawaii. So this is really specific. This is targeting, I'm not targeting, but we, you know, we want to focus on certain members that are looking at certain things. And as a result, we want to take another action and send them an email um, based on this new, this new hotel we have. So how this would look from a data perspective is you have this page view and we've got the session, we've got a timestamp um, and we've got the property ID and lots of other metadata. But we need to get it to this enriched page view. We need to kind of get the information from page view to the enriched page view and this is going to tell us um, whether or not we want to act on this. Like in this case, this page view on the left, we enrich it. Um, the person is not looking at a beach property and they're not the level of, um, they're, they're, you know, they're not at the level that we want to target. It's gold level member. So how this would look in, we would use a, a Kafka Streams application and Kafka Streams is an abstraction over producers and consumers. And it uh, saves you a lot of the hassle of working with consumers and producers yourself. It allows you to focus on business object, uh, your, your business um, domain, your problem within your business domain. So you'd start your Streams application, you give it, a, give it the name of a topic to read from and a, a topic to, to write to, and then you have your um, processes in between that do things. So you're going to read, you're going to possibly, you're going to enrich the data, then make a decision whether or not you want to move forward with it, and then write out those objects to your promotion event topic. So how do we go about enriching the object? Obviously, they, they are a page view object. So we need access to uh, information. So the most logical thing, or what we've done in the past, is you have a database. And that database, you could think of as a, as a lookup database. So now it's coming in, you've got your properties, you want to query the database to find other bits to fill in the missing bits of information. So this solves, the, this is how you would solve the how do I enrich it issue. But it in, adds in, another one, because it adds another issue, because you basically end up with um, latency and, and throughput issues because now uh, your database is going to be remote. So now you've got the time it takes to query the database and get the results back. And additionally, if you're, uh, let's just say that this is a large operation, so you have several um, streams applications, several instances of them, you've got this one database. So everyone's kind of hitting this one database and it can only serve so many requests at a time. So you've got a bottleneck there too. So everybody's hitting, everyone's hitting the database at the same time. So that's a problem. And then finally, you've got availability. availability. Um, if that database goes down, everybody can process. It's going to take down everyone. Um, you know, things break, but here you've got an example of, you know, if the network connectivity to the database is down, the database itself goes down, then that's going to affect everyone else. And then the, you've also got the throughput issue of, you know, constantly going to the data and looking it up. So next step could be you could put a cache there. So you query things, and as they come in, you store them in the cache. Um, but that lends itself to how often do you update because you need to update that information that's in the cache. So you're going to need to, to do that. So how would you go about doing that? Um, so within Kafka Streams, 
we have this notion of you would have a K table. Um, we explain you, uh, Kafka Streams has two main components of its API, a K stream and a K table. K stream is considered an event stream. And by an event stream, I mean that each record stands on its own. And since it's Kafka, it's key value pairs. If an event comes in with the same key, multiple events come in with the same key, they stand alone. Each one's considered a discrete event, doesn't have anything to do with it. But a K table is considered an update. So if three records come in with the same key, each one is considered an update to the previous event. You only keep that latest one. So now we've got, um, so basically, You've got the, you've, you've got something that's consuming from your database and putting and you've got a consumer that's writing it to a topic and that's what your K table is doing. You would do a join, you would do a stream table join uh, to enrich it. But now we, we're still we, we can take this a step further. And now we're going to use Kafka Connect and a CDC connector, change data capture connection. And what that means is every time there's an insert, update, delete on that table, Connect is going to capture that and send that to our topic that we're using for the K table. In this case, it is the um, customer's table right here. So we've got Kafka Connect and our CDC connector um, running and it's going to capture all these changes and automatically send them. And then this enables us to do our enrichment. And then we're going to take it even a step further. And with Kafka Streams, it's written in Java. So you have to write a Java application for that. You have to write code. Uh, with KSQL, or actually, I need to update these slides, KSQL DB, you would you open up a prompt and you log into your KSQL instance and you would just simply write this query here. And you've got your promotion stream. And basically, and this goes back to the duality of streams and tables. Here we're saying we want to select the customer email, the name from the page view events, that stream of things that are coming in and do a left out or join a customer table um, where the customer ID and the page view ID, the page view customer ID and, and the ID of the person in the customer table match where the customer class is prompt. Now, there's, uh, this, obviously, this query doesn't have all the attributes we wanted, but you're getting the point here. So now it's even a step. It's simplified a step further. So you've got your event stream coming in. You write this query via KSQL that just constantly query that it's just constantly running as the events come in and we're doing a join based off of more stateful information that gives us uh, the desired result of something that we can take action on and then write that back out to our um, promotions topic. So here we've used Kafka Connect, CDC connectors and KSQL to take state that's in a database and kind of combine it with the stream of events that are coming into Kafka and then convert it back into state by doing the enrichment and making a new object, um, creating it back, you know, turning it back into state, which is then is going to reside like you're going to have an application somewhere that's going to be querying this promotion stream and it's going to be holding it, you know, it might be caching it there or just, you know, viewing it as it's going by in some dashboard. So this is, this is, this is a big win for microservices because, as I mentioned, uh, one of the points I need to go back on real quick, if you bear with me. Um, and this, in this slide right here, this database it's not local, it's remote. So you've got this connection here that you have to navigate and that adds latency. You know, let's just say it doesn't go down. It's still, it's not local. So you have to retrieve the data and bring it back. But in our example here with the K table, the state is now local. 
So it's it gets pushed into a consumer, but then it gets consumed. So those lookups, it doesn't have to go remote. That that is local. That's local to each instance. So it saves you processing time, but also importantly, if for some reason this particular instance that we're looking at, if this goes down or you lose this application, it doesn't affect the other other applications within your that you have deployed. Uh, as a matter of fact, if this application were to go down, rebalance happens, the uh, partitions this particular consumer was responsible for are assigned to other members, and then it just keeps going. So what, what that means is each microservice that you have running, each instance of it that's hitting this, it has its own localized DB, it has its own localized state, but it's sharing a global truth because it's coming from a centralized source of truth from somewhere. It's just that for processing, it's, it's handled locally. Um, so to sum it up, we've got um, the patterns we talked about. We're streaming everything into Kafka. Kafka is your central nervous system for data. Uh, keeping compatibility, where your event object, your model object that's streaming through, that's your API. And you need to keep that. That's what everybody else is using as the contract. So you need to keep compatibility with those. Um, and then parallel single message transformations, you know, as your records are coming in to do some sort of transformation on them, or as they're going out, transfer them. You, you know, transform them somehow. Um, you don't have to store redundant, the advantage that is you don't have to store redundant bits of information, just transform as you're writing it out. And then streaming enrichment, basically, as your events are coming in, you're going to want to do some sort of stateful join or some stateful operation to add context uh, to those events. And that's all I have for for you this evening. Um, thanks a lot. Um, hopefully this has been uh, the first time presenting uh, in this uh, medium. Usually I'm used to, used to standing in front of a lot of people. But thank you for your time and attention. Uh, please stay in touch. That's my Twitter handle, my email. And then uh, I'm on, that's our, con our community Slack. You can check out our blog and um, we have other meetups going on, although they're all virtual now. Um, thank you. Thank you, Bill. Um, so yeah, that was that was really good. I wasn't familiar with Kafka, so this is a really good overview. Uh, I saw that we had a question pop up at some point. Um, if you would still like to answer that, or sure. after that, then um, I was yeah, I sorry, the questioner. But I think uh, would you be cool with some questions right now, Bill? Oh yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, I apologize if I didn't answer questions. It was uh, I couldn't see with this setup, but uh, um, I'm going to stop sharing now. Cool. Okay. So, if anyone has any questions, feel free to pop them in. I guess we'll do like ten minutes of questions. Is that cool, David? Yo. That means yes. Oh. Okay. Hey, Bill. Yes. Yeah. This is Jim. Um, I'm curious, what uh, what kind of cool customer uh, applications and kind of use cases are you seeing most prevalent um, leveraging Kafka? Um, probably, well, my, I, I spent a lot of time in the security domain previously, so I would say like anomaly detection. Um, I know like Wells Fargo, um, well, I don't know if I'm supposed to mention customer names, but anyway, that's out of the bag. Um, we've got customers that, you know, do it for, uh, anomaly detection, um, things of that nature. Um, uh, uh, I didn't. I don't have a, a great example off the top of my head. Um, let me think about this for a second. Um, 
I know one of the things is that. How about LinkedIn? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, LinkedIn uses Kafka for like they dump everything into Kafka. Um, as far as like the particular transformations they're doing, I don't don't have necessarily have an idea of that. Um, um, I know there was another auto manufacturer that was using Kafka there. They put sensors. They've got the cars are constantly streaming back information. And they're I can help you with that. That's, uh, that, that's Audi. So um, if anybody uh, on this call is lucky enough to have one of the uh, 2019 um, or newer Audi A4s and up, when you um, purchase your vehicle, you can opt into a new program uh, where Audi is constantly collecting the data from the road, the sensors um, on the vehicle, and they actually feed that all into Kafka. And then those cars actually will all communicate to each other. And you'll get a warning on your display that maybe you're approaching some black ice or tire pressure is too low. Would you like us to go ahead and uh, actually set up an appointment with the dealership? Um, things of that nature are uh, are some of the some of the IoT sensor uh, use cases that Kafka is being used for. Um, I see one question in the chat um, from Sunil. Uh, so Natalie, uh, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Um, is it similar to a message queue? Uh, okay, all right, Sonny, thanks. Um, similar to a message queue. At a very basic level, at a very high level, yes, but it's a lot more than that because again, the event comes in, it gets appended to the end of the log, and it's not really a queue because no one, it's not backing anything up. It's you can consume from it, uh, and there's so many other things that you can do with the entire platform. Um, whether it be, you know, I mentioned Connect, uh, Kafka Streams, or KSQL. Um, so at a, at a certain level, it is a message coming in, um, but it's much more than because most message queues have to retain the message in memory, and once everyone consumes it, you register the consumers. It keeps the state of who's consuming it. Once it's consumed, it's gone. And that's not the case here. Uh, yeah, but, question. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, I, this is David. I just had a, a question. Um, like a couple of things. One, one is how how many how much data do people generally keep in their topics? Um, and you know, I know that that may, may vary quite a bit, but like using let's just say using the the hub. Uh, pattern that you talked about, um, I guess the enterprise event hub or whatever. I'm not sure what the, the name of it architecture is, but the hub and spoke pattern that you showed. Um, let's just say I wanted to, you know, use that for all my data, you know, in 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 my enterprise uh, and, and feed it through there. So so how much, how many, how much? Uh, I guess what what maybe we do it in terms of time. You know, like how, how much time of date, how much, how what length of data, duration of data would you keep? in your topics uh, for an enterprise solution like that? Um, again, like you said, that's going to vary very widely across enterprises. Um, but let's just say in a general, like, you know, I want to have a, a general purpose uh, architecture to stream my data, you know, and, and use that pattern. What would be a good rule of thumb for uh, the, the length of uh, the size of the data that you want to keep? Uh, the default retention, just out of the box, default retention is a week. Um, so I would say that, um, anywhere from a week to like 30 days, somewhere in there. And it really depends on how often, you know, how long you need that data to stick around. Um, our enterprise solution has something, um, uh, unlimited storage, where basically it's the data is, um, only so much is kept local, and then the rest of it is behind the scenes shipped off someplace else, let's say S3. Um, so it could live 
for however long, you know, an S3, it could be there forever. Um, it's so hard it, to, go ahead. So could, could, could it be a replacement for like a data lake? I mean, you know, could, cause I know Jay Krebs has talked about like in some of the blogs I've like, I've read that, you know, he kind of talks about like, replacing the, it, it can act like a database, you know, essentially. And you know, it's like a, a replayable, uh, database with all the, you know, with all the history. Yeah. And in, in that sense, yes. Um, I wouldn't want to say it's like a database and the fact that you want to go back and say, okay, you know, I want to see this record from this single record from October the 5th, 2013. You could certainly get it by replaying. So it's not, um, it can act as a database and you could certainly use it to get rid of the data lake. But going back to the connector issue, if you have a need for like, you're constantly running queries and you want like point in time queries. Um, you could use connect to write that out to a database. So in that sense, you could do that. Um, but with tiered storage is the word I was looking for with tiered storage, uh, only a certain amount is going to be on the broker itself. And then the rest is like, I think right now it's S3. The rest is written out someplace else. Um, in lieu of um, tiered storage, you could um, use Replicator to kind of replicate the data out to someplace else. Use Replicator, or I guess, I guess use Connect, I'm sorry, um, to write it out someplace longer term if you needed to. Did that answer your question? Yeah, I'm just curious about the, I mean, because I'm, yeah, just thank you. That was good. Okay. Think Sonny, did I answer uh, Sonny, did I answer your question? I see one in the chat there. And then um, okay. And then actually Sonny, I see you have another question, but Arena asked a question, so I'd like to answer her question. Then I'll come back to you if that's okay. Um Arena's question is do you see traditional Relational NoSQL database is going away in favor of streaming. I, I wouldn't say no. I think they're um, they're going to be used less. I think you're always going to have a use case for uh, a relational database, whether it's um, some you know NoSQL or something like Oracle. Um, but I see it taking less of a role, like the central role is going to be your streaming platform because it, again, it's kind of like your central nervous system. Everything's going to come through there and then you know, you're going to push that out someplace else um, for, you know, however else your organization is going to use it. And a lot of times it's, um, you also have um, legacy things, you know, you have your, the way thing, the way business has been done, you already have you know, customers, you already have applications that are used to hitting a relational database. So there's not necessarily a need to rip that out, but how, how those underlying storage systems, how they get their data, that's certainly something that's seamless to the user. Did I answer your question? Okay. And then, Sonny, you had another question. Um, what is the underlying database Kafka uses? Kafka doesn't use, Kafka itself does not use a database. Um, records come in, they get appended to the end of a log, which is basically a file, so they just keep getting appended. And those records get a, a, a number. It's just basically a one-up number. It's called an offset. Um, so those just keep getting appended to the end. And how consumers consumers keep track of what they've read so far. Like Kafka itself does not keep track of who's reading what. So if you have a consumer, it, it's at the simplest level, let's consider a single part to, uh, a topic with a single partition, you have a consumer. It's going to read records. Let's just say it's read 10 records so far. So the next offset it's going to read from is 11. And so that's how it happens. Records come in, they get appended, 
Uh, your consumer is going to read, and then the consumer commits the offsets that it's seen so that when it's, you take it down and it starts up again, it knows exactly where it's going to, um, where it's going to read from. Um, within Kafka Streams, for the stateful operations, it uses, out of the box, it uses RocksDB for the, um, it's a key value store, so it's not like a traditional relational database. And then for stateful operations within Kafka Streams, it doesn't have to be, um, RocksDB is like a persistent store. It, you know, you take your streams app down, the state still lives in that store. Uh, you can use in-memory stores. Um, now that all the, both the per, both the persistent state and in-memory in stores are backed by a change log topic. So if for some reason where your application is deployed with your streams app, um, and KSQL is going to have the same thing under the covers, if that state gets blown away, it's all kept in a change log topic. So when you start back up, it's going to read the record from the change log topic and fully restore. Um, can you compare Kafka with Azure Event Hub? Unfortunately, I am not as familiar with Azure Event Hub. Um, so I would hate to give you, I could certainly take a look at that and get back to you later, but I'd hate to give you an answer because I'm just not familiar with Azure Event Hub at the moment. It, Azure Event Hub's bill is just Event Hub's from Microsoft. Okay. It, it's just their cloud native version of event hubs. Okay. I mean, I, I, I've messed around with it. it it's, um, they have a Kafka API um, that sits on top of event hubs. And it, so it, it looks a lot like Kafka. I mean, underneath the covers, I don't know what they did. Maybe they, maybe they took the Kafka code, ported it over. I don't know, but uh, uh, it's, it, it behaves a lot like Kafka and it, but they have their own some own, their own features in their proprietary to Microsoft. Um, yeah, I, I don't want to say too much about it because I haven't used it in production. So. Can you talk about the pricing? Like, I mean, like, what, give us a ballpark idea. Like, how much would this cost to stand up a, you know? some sort of real thing. Um, Bill, you want me to talk about that? So I'm going to defer that over to Jim. Yeah, please. Hey, guys. Jim, so you, I didn't get a chance you, to introduce myself. Yeah, why don't you do that? I'm, I'm so sorry. I'm, I'm Jim Lee. I am uh, the account manager and account executive for the Richmond area um, for Confluent, the founders of Apache Kafka. Um, so, you know, any of your event streaming needs, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. I'm just uh, Jim Lee at Confluent.io and I can share my information. But um, in terms of pricing, uh, if you want to get started with uh, Apache Kafka, um, you can get started with uh, in any three of our, you know, major clouds available today. We are cloud native in uh, Google, Microsoft and AWS. Um, and you can get started uh, with uh, usage-based pricing and uh, start, you know, there's uh, $120 available for you to spin up a cluster um, for free, for a free trial over the next three months. Um, and you can just log in and, and do that today uh, at our website, confluent.io. Um, to answer the event hubs question, um, so there's a lot of specific needs for, you know, event hubs and we partner, uh, we're a first class citizen inside of Microsoft Azure. Um, what you're going to find is that event hubs is more of a pub sub um, type of solution. Uh, as Bill was mentioning, uh, you're going to leverage Kafka and Confluent for that central nervous system. When you really want to scale up and you've got them, you know, a bazillion events like uh, one of our customers, Lyft, um, uses Conf uh, Confluent Cloud Enterprise to uh, go ahead and marry that GPS data with the historical traffic patterns, 
with your pricing algorithm to spit out an ETA all in kind of a contextual format that you know is really easy to use and process on your screen that's when you use confluent and and, and kafka if you just want to do pub sub um, and and you know a messaging queue event hubs or google pub sub or you know whatever whatever is going to work great for you but when you want to scale up and you know fundamentally move away from batch processing and and go in kind of a different direction that's when that's when we typically raise our hand and say hey you want to start looking at streaming architecture you want to start looking at a different way of thinking about um kind of those interactions and and those events i hope that helped dave thanks thanks for uh letting me giving me two minutes to give my spiel I have a question. You, uh, there was an analogy used that that um, that the uh, uh, Kafka is as a streaming hub is kind of like the central nervous system. Is there a way to control access to which endpoints are available to certain? I'll call them clients, or is this assumed that everybody's equal who has access to the central nervous system? Let's say, you know, for certain connectors, I, I you know, I only want uh, certain. Sorry if I'm not using the terminology correct. If I wanted to control access to those, you know, um, is that, or am I not even thinking about this, this kind of this philosophy of of streaming? Am I not even thinking about it correctly? Right. I'm coming from you know APIs connecting to one another, microservices, kind of more, more traditional stacks. So you can correct me if I'm wrong. No, that's a great question. Um, that definitely comes about. There's something called. Um, we have role-based access control. Uh, and then you can also secure, um, you can also secure your cluster, two things. You could secure your cluster, um, you know, lock it down so you have to have certain, like you, not just anyone can access it. And then you have role-based access controls, which really gives you fine-grained control over who can read from which topic. So that, that's actually, that's an, that's, that's an excellent question because within certain organizations, that's definitely an issue or a concern, let's just say. And I shouldn't say an issue. It's something that they want. Thanks, Dave. I guess that's going to wrap it up, Sam. Did we yeah. lose? Yeah, no, no worries. Um, so yeah, I guess that's it for questions. Thank you so much, Bill, for, for answering sure. them. Um, I'll go ahead and announce anything we have for, for Arvade now. So uh, we don't really have a planned event for June just yet. Um, you know, we might do sort of a co-meetup with another meetup and then, you know, just do that virtually and kind of, uh, you know, merge the meetups together. Uh, so we'll see. If anybody has anything or would like to speak, you know, feel free to reach out to myself, David, Julia, or Brandon. Um, let's see. I don't really think there's much else going on. Uh, I don't think there's any other meetups happening in the next couple of weeks in the data realm for Richmond. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much it. Thank you again, Bill. Sure. Thanks, no guys, for attending. Thanks for having me, guys. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks so much, Bill. Really appreciate it. And, and Jim, too. This yeah. Thank great, you, Bill. Oh, sure. Yeah. Thank you very much, Confluent. Okay. Bill's a rock star. Thank you, Bill. Sure thing. Thank you, guys. Appreciate the yeah. time. All right. See you guys. See you guys.